Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us early in the morning after your hikes up in the mountains. I hope you all had a good hike or a good swim. Or um, So we're, this morning, we're going to talk about interregional transmission. Super exciting topic, super important topic. Um, and we have four really excellent speakers for you today. So I'm going to introduce the topic with someone else's slide. This is Hannah Spiefenberger's slide, and this is just a great slide. Um, so as you know, um, US transmission needs are identified through a bunch of different kinds of processes. And um, these top processes, uh, reliability projects, um, long-term transmission service projects, generator interconnection, of course, regional reliability, these occur, I mean, account for over 90% of all transmission investments in the US. So most of what we're doing in transmission is coming through these boxes up here around reliability, around generator interconnection, you know, running a load flow, looking at your N minus one contingency and looking at uh, reliability criteria. So um, what we're not seeing a whole lot of is in this yellow box here, this is the regional economic and public policy projects. This is resulting in less than 10% of all US transmission investments. Now, hopefully, you know, things like MISO's LRTP and other efforts like that are going to change this. Um, but then this last box here, this last box here is joint RTO interregional planning processes. And these um, are largely ineffective. We're, we're not getting much done in this last box. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Um, when we look across studies, and Adria is going to talk much more about this, we find that we need large scale interregional transmission in order to deliver that triple goal that Alice talked about yesterday, affordable, reliable, clean. And David's gonna delve into the details of um, not one of these studies, but a study just like this. Now, unfortunately, um, M Michael Skelly from Grid United was gonna be here today. He had to um, run off to a super important uh, meeting to, uh, anyway, super important meeting. He was going to talk about Grid United's interregional transmission projects. He's got a whole bunch of these great projects and most of them are not gen ties, right? They're not the kind of project that brings large amounts of wind and solar to load, but rather they're projects that connect regions for diversity. And because they're connecting regions for diversity, they're paying for themselves in a different way. Um, here at ESIG, we had a, a multi-value transmission benefits task force um, that analyzed value streams for projects like Grid United's uh, projects. And um, uh, one of the case studies we did in our study was to look at connecting ERCOT to the Southeast Southern Company. And what you see is that, um, you know, we had some modest production cost savings, um, some modest capital cost savings because you build um, uh, generators with higher capacity factor instead of uh, lower capacity factors. Uh, we had a little bit of resilience savings but we had a huge amount of resource adequacy savings. Um, and this was really different from the Gentai type of transmission project. Um, in particular, we found that this two gigawatt transmission um, line would improve resource adequacy in these two regions, similar to building two gigawatts of generators in ERCOT and two gigawatts of generators in Southern Company. So just a, a huge value stream. Um, so the idea is that uh, with different types of projects, you're going to have different types of benefits, and you're really going to need to look at, um, you know, a multitude of benefits in order to really understand what that project is bringing to the table. And um, now Dev is going to talk further about what actual production cost savings look like with um, uh, in historical um, operations, because it may be that in our modeling, we may be underestimating uh, this production cost savings. Meanwhile, as you probably know, Europe is going full speed ahead and they've recognized the need, they're building into regional transmission. Um, you can see you know, exports um, uh, 
of electricity between different countries increasing over time. You can see net transfer capability um, between different countries increasing. If you were here in October, you probably heard Peter Markerson um, from EnergyNet talk about um, uh, the, the rules and the targets for interregional capability and how they want not only um, some amount of interregional capability, but also to have that available to the marketplace for, for trading. So not all tied up in, in bilateral contracts. So, um, and Antia is going to talk more about the, the European situation, especially with a focus on the offshore networks uh, slides. So Dr. H. Brooks currently serves as a transmission planning engineer at the US DOE Grid Deployment Office, uh, where she uh, served, previously served as a transmission engineer at the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin and as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Adria holds a PhD in electrical engineering uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And Adria is going to talk to us about the new DOE transmission needs study. We're super excited about this study. Great. Can everyone hear me? All right. Awesome. So thanks for having me. Um, Dev was going to be the precursor to this, which is good because a lot of his work is included, but you'll just have to get that later. Um, so just quickly notice, because I am with the Department of Energy, the information presented here is not legally binding. This is meant for informational purposes related to the draft National Transmission Needs Study. And then if there's anything in this which appears discrepant from the needs study itself, needs study takes precedent, though there should not be any of that. Okay, so what is the needs study? So previously, the department has been putting out what we've called our national transmission congestion studies. We did rework that and relabel it to be called the need study for a number of reasons. The bipartisan infrastructure law um, did amend the Federal Power Act, which mandates that the department put out these assessments every three years. So we are um, required to conduct historic and now also anticipated future transmission capacity constraint and congestion studies every three years of the power grid and in consultation with states, Indian tribes, and the regional grid entities. Now that said, I'm not gonna go over the consultation process just because of time, but I'm happy to answer those questions if they come up. So this serves as, as the department's triennial state of the grid report, we review historic industry data, recent power system studies, as well as published capacity expansion results, which Debbie was alluding to earlier. So this is gonna be published targeting the end of summer of this year, following a public comment period, which we are in now. So I'll at the very end show you how you can submit public comments. So just some framing, what the study is and what it isn't. So the objective of this is to do an assessment of needs. We're not prescribing specific transmission solutions. So we're gonna say here are the needs of the power system and then we're relying on industry, relying on the public to come forward and say, okay, we think these are the solutions that might be best for these needs. For methods, we're only considering published data and reports. There's over 80 references in the report, and I anticipate that's going to grow after public comment period. But we're not doing any new modeling, cost benefit analysis, or system planning. A lot of that work is being done in other DOE studies, specifically the one that David's going to talk about later. And then the output, we do organize the needs of the study by geographic regions, so broad geographic regions of the contiguous US. Um, but those regions, just to be clear, are not synonymous with transmission corridors. Okay, so here's the outline of the needs study. Executive summary, of course, then we have these first three chapters of framing and introduction, the legislative language, which require us, requires us to conduct this study. And then transmission concepts to try to bring folks up to a similar page when they get into the results. These last three sections or chapters are really where the results, the needs study come in. And these are the sections I'm gonna focus on today. So historical data as an understanding of the current need of the power grid, a review of existing studies to understand both current and future needs on the power grid, and then capacity expansion modeling to try to understand anticipated future need on the system. And then here is the, um, the website. So for those of you with your computers open, you can go there. You can also Google it. Um, this will bring up not only the study itself, but then also a webinar recording of an hour and a half of this presentation, which I'm just going to give like a 15 minute version of here. Okay. So that said, these are the three big national takeaways, right? 
we write these 200 page reports and then we're required like all right, get this down into three sentences. So here are the three sentences, the state of the grid, uh, as far as the Department of Energy is concerned. So there's a pressing need for new transmission infrastructure. Interregional transmission results in the largest benefits and needs are gonna shift over time, right? So like we know what we need today is not the same thing as what we're gonna need in 2030 or 2040. So here's that first chapter um, with results. So historical data, we have a section on historical transmission investments, looking at historic data from the 2010s, a section on market price differentials. And this is what Dev is gonna talk about in more detail in a moment. Qualified paths in the West, and then also interconnection queues and data from the interconnection queues. I'm just gonna give some high level overviews from this first section um, and not the subsequent three sections. Okay, so one of the first findings in these studies is that transmission in investments decreased during the second half of the 2010s. So what's shown here are rolling three-year averages of the amount of circuit miles that were energized every year between 2011 and 2020. We did three-year averages because we know these investments are lumpy, so we're trying to get rid of some of that lumpiness. If you look at the cluster of bars all the way to the left, this is all regions. So that's the entire contiguous United States. We can see there's a steady rise in transmission investments through 2015, and then a steady decrease the rest of the decade. And that was relatively true in all individual regions as well, which are broken out in the other um, bar charts. Another thing we found is that non-incumbent developers, so otherwise known as emergent developers, their share of energized projects decreased from its height at 40% in 2013 to less than 5% of all energized projects in 2020. So the non-incumbent developers are that top bar, that salmon color, um, or that like light peach color. And the incumbent developers, the regulated utilities, are the, the salmon color underneath. So you can see that there is the most even share in 2013, and then that dropping off significantly up until 2020. In addition to looking at who was installing, we also looked at why were projects being installed. So these are the primary drivers of all projects that were energized. We found the share of projects addressing liability concerns. So in that light blue, those have, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the reliability projects are in purple um, at the very bottom. Those have increased slightly from 2011 to 2020. So they're about 50% of all projects in 2011. And then in 2020, almost 75% of all projects were addressing liability concerns. Now on the other end of that, the share of high capacity projects. So now we're looking at that light blue um, in the middle of these columns. Those have decreased. So these high capacity projects, these are what we think of as those really long interregional lines, right? So 345 kV connecting multiple states, moving a lot of generation, often renewables, but not always gas. Um, or coal are also included in here. We had a large investment in those in 2011 through 2013, and those dropped off pretty precipitously to where almost none were installed in 2020. Okay, so with that, we're gonna move into just briefly showing you the review of existing studies section. So again, these are current and future needs. We looked at 50 studies in this section, and I'll show that on the next slide, which studies we considered. In going through all those different studies, we're trying to understand what are they telling us about the power grid? And as we're going through, we looked for themes. Those themes were organized into the sections you see here. So looked at reliability, resource adequacy, clean energy integration, congestion in each of the different regions, curtailment of generation sources, resilience of the power grid, electrification and what specific needs come up as we electrify more and more end use devices. And then also non-wires alternatives. Notably, this is the first congestion study or needs study that really focuses on non-wires alternatives. So the way that we use the term transmission throughout the report, that's meant to be technology agnostic. So where a non-wire could serve that need, great. If it needs to be a wire, that's fine too. We try to spell that out. Then we also put a small section in here on barriers to transmission development. Now, again, I'm not gonna cover any of these just because of time, um, but happy to answer questions if they come up. So here are the 50 studies that we considered. I know there are a lot of uh, folks who write studies, who read studies. Y'all are all good users of studies. So looking at these, if there's um, things that you want to say about it. So for example, the studies that I rely on most in my work aren't included in here. That's the type of feedback we would love to hear in the public comments. So just briefly to talk about what types of studies are in here. So about a quarter of them are all Department of Energy studies. So those coming out of the national labs. 
Another quarter are coming from consultants. We have a handful from academia, and then almost half of them are coming from industry itself. So from the different um, ISOs, from the transmission planning regions, from NERC, from FERC. Um, and so, so I should say that there were about 40 studies that we initially considered and going back to 2018, so we had to give ourselves a cutoff. And then 10 studies we wound up adding as a result of the consultation that we did with the RTOs, um, with the reliability planning regions, with the states. Um, so there's the opportunity to continue to add more studies here, but most of these were in response to someone asking us to put them in. Okay, so now on to the last chapter, and this one might be of um, particular interest to you all, and then Debbie also teed this up. So we did look at capacity expansion modeling to try to help us understand anticipated future need. And again, this is new. This was not included in previous congestion studies. This is really our first crack at trying to understand this. The sections in here, we look at included scenarios within region transmission deployment, interregional transfer capacity, and then also international transfers. I'm just going to talk about the first three for time. Okay, so we took data from six different capacity expansion studies, and we analyzed that to try to understand the future regional and interregional transmission needs. So we're only looking at studies that had come out since the previous congestion study was published, which was last done in 2020. So we have four NREL reports, um, all using the REEDS capacity expansion modeling. So a lot of folks are familiar with that or heard about it yesterday during the tutorials. And then we have two academic reports that we also looked at. Um, so Princeton's Net Zero America, and then also the study out of MIT's The Value of Interregional Coordination Study. So we looked at scenarios across all six of these different studies to try to understand what they tell us about the transmission system of the future. Okay, so there are 300 different scenarios among those six studies, and they describe a really wide range of power sector features. So I recognize on these screens, it's a little hard to see this, so I'll just talk you through it. Each one of those small black dots, that's one of those 300 scenarios among the six different studies. On the y-axis, that is total load in 2040. On the x-axis, that is generation provided by clean energy resources. So that green diamond at the bottom, that's where we are in 2021. So we're about 40% clean energy generation in 2021, and then just over 4,000 terawatt hours of load. So any black dot to the right of that green diamond, that means a growth in clean energy generation between now and 2040. Any black dot above it, that is change in growth or, um, sorry, uh, growth in load between now and 2040. So we can see there's a handful of scenarios that are pretty close to 2021, and then some that are very, very far away. We had to figure out a way to make sense of these 300 scenarios, right? You can imagine these different power sector futures are gonna require very different transmission solutions in order to deliver this much clean energy or in order to deliver this much um, or provide electricity to this much load. So we looked for these natural groupings and those really pop out here. Even if you aren't familiar with these type of graphs, you can see there's like three groups that just immediately jump out of the page. So those black histogram charts at the top and then on the right, those are histograms of how many scenarios fell into each one of these buckets of clean energy generation or of total load. And then those red contour maps in the middle, um, you can think of those as like a topographical map where you have these three mountains jumping out at you. That's a two-dimensional histogram. That's telling you how many scenarios fell within each of those buckets. So we use these three kind of natural groupings or buckets to try to understand transmission solutions. And I'll just walk through them. So the first is what we're calling this moderate clean energy, moderate load growth group. So this means some clean energy growth between now and 2040, some load growth between now and 2040, but not necessarily a super significant amount. The scenarios that fell into this group were market driven. So the researchers just took away all state, federal or local policies, just let the markets drive. And then also scenarios that had existing policies and existing being those that were on the books at the time the research was done. And of course these research projects were done over many, many years. Sorry, so that there's a four year span here. Um, so they had some different policies on the books, but nonetheless, Scenarios that fell in this group, there are about 80 of them. Moderate clean energy, moderate load growth as a result. On the opposite end of that spectrum, we had high clean energy and high load growth um, bucket. Here, those scenarios that fell into that group um, had to be driven by new policies only. Uh, there were no 
pol or scenarios that fell in here that were driven by existing policies or by markets alone, they would require new state or new federal policies to come online to push the power system into this group. And then we have this middle group, so high clean energy growth, moderate load growth. So pretty significant clean energy growth, but not a lot of load growth compared to where we are today. In this group, there was a whole range of different scenarios. So those that were driven by markets alone, those that were driven by existing policies, and again, existing policies that were on the books at the time the research was done, and then new policies as well. Something that I think is really important to point out here, though, is that with the Inflation Reduction Act being signed into law, we think the power sector of the future is going to fall within this moderate high scenario group. So that's research that came out of the national labs, but then also has come out of other institutions as well, independent of DOE. So in the past, when we first started working in this, we thought that our kind of business as usual scenario case might fall into that moderate, moderate group. But thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act and then all the modeling that we've done since then, we think the new, like uh, our new normal, so to speak, is gonna be in this high moderate group. Uh, so for that reason, I'm just gonna focus on the high moderate group um, results in the subsequent slides, but do know that we have results from all three of these scenario groups in the study itself. Okay, so then here is what the scenarios that fall into that moderate high group tell us what we need for transmission in the future. So on the y-axis, we have all the 13 regions of the US and there's a map in the bottom corner there to help orient you. Those gray bars, that's how much transmission we have within each of those regions today. And then the green bars, that is the anticipated range of where we need to be. So we have large gaps to fill in some of these regions to go from the gray bar to get into somewhere in that green range. And I will say for that green range, uh, we're intentionally showing a range of results. We're not choosing just a single number, right? We know none of those scenarios that were modeled is gonna be exactly accurate. We anticipate that a good number of them probably will be close though, right? So for that reason, we're showing a range of anticipated need in 2035. Oh, I'm also, I'm showing 2035 results here. We do have 2030, we do have 24 year results as well in the study, but for today, just 2035. So if we look at these top four regions, we see the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast and the Plains. That's where we see the largest anticipated range of new transmission in 2035. But if we look at the gap to fill, those top four uh, regions actually change. So those are the largest gap to fill between where we are today and 2035, Midwest, Southeast, Plains, and Texas. So we can do the same thing also for inter-regional transfer capacity. So before we we're just looking at within region transmission, now we're looking at sharing among these 13 different regions. We do the exact same thing. We can look at the transfers. We just focus on those top four right, of a total anticipated need in 2035. Mid-Atlantic to the Midwest, Midwest to the Plains, Delta to the Plains, and then also Mountain to the Northwest. But again, if we just wanna focus on the gap to fill where we have to be installing the most transmission over the next 12 years, uh, then what also jumps out is Plains to Texas. So they're kind of middle of the pack in terms of absolute need, but in, in regards to the amount of new transmission, they really do jump out as where we need to focus some attention. Um, so that is just the teaser of all the results that are in this, but there is a lot of information that's in the study itself. So here is how you would submit comments. Instructions are also on that website uh, that I posted at the beginning. Um, but you would just submit your comments as an attachment to this email address. You can also use this email address to reach me or to reach folks on this team uh, if you want to set up a meeting to answer questions or to talk further. So thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. I guess we're doing some now. and then We're going to go to David Polchak next. Um, and David's a manager and a researcher in the Grid Planning and Analysis Center at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where he leads a team focused on high renewable energy bulk power systems and enabling technologies for maintaining efficient and reliable grids. Um, he's going to talk to us today about um, DOE's uh, signature study, the National Transmission Planning Study, that many of you, I think, are on the Technical Review Committee for and we're all really excited about the, the outputs from this study. So take it away, Dave. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, thanks to ESIC for having me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the National Transmission Planning Study. Um, this is a study that is a little over halfway done. Um, and I'm gonna give some kind of interim results here. Okay, so I think Debbie and Adria kind of laid out the case for interregional national strategies for um, both decarbonization and transmission development. So I'm not gonna go into that too much. 
um, this study is focused on um, this interregional and national strategy for transmission development. Um, part of that is engaging stakeholders. As Debbie said, we have a lot of people around the country involved in this study and, and trying to make this useful, relevant, and additive for stakeholders um, that are planning the transmission systems. Um, this study gets into, I, I would say, more details than what Adria laid out in terms of actually planning um, specific corridors, planning specific lines, and trying to make this something that stakeholders could pick up and take into their planning processes. So uh, this last point, we're really trying to identify viable and efficient transmission options um, that will provide broad scale benefits. So those benefits um, that Debbie laid out, really trying to understand those and make sure we capture all of these different benefits um, that transmission can bring to the system. And when I say transmission options, this, this could mean a lot of different things. Um, probably, you know, we're not transmission planners, so we're not going to identify, you know, very specific lines, but we're, we are going to identify the challenges of specific pathways and corridors, you know, and hopefully um, it can be taken to the next step um, by stakeholders. Okay, so I'm going to focus in on the transmission planning approach in this study. There's a lot of different parts of this study, um, but I'm going to talk about some of the modeling that we're doing to give us actual specific um, Options. So the zonal generation and transmission capacity expansion planning. So that uh, reads a lot of those kind of um, sorts of results were shown by Adria, where we uh, use our capacity expansion model to help understand, you know, what's the future system look like. Um, I'm going to focus in on some of the results of the nodal uh, transmission expansion planning. So getting to actual systems that work essentially within a production cost model, um, actually building the system to specific substations. Um, and reaching some actual uh, kind of transmission plan and transmission um, lines. And then the system stability is another piece of this study that I won't get into today, but that's certainly down the line and something we hope you know, our systems kind of hold up to um, that sort of rigor in modeling. Okay, so Patrick Brown gave, um, gave a presentation in the fall 2022 workshop on our capacity expansion scenario. So I just wanna provide a brief recap. Um, some of you were probably there, but just to set up where I'm going into more of the nodal modeling. Okay, so we have many scenarios that we're looking at uh, for our future system. We have a scenario framework. I'm just gonna lay out quickly. We have four essentially transmission paradigms. We have a limited system where we limit the transmission being planned uh, within the planning regions. And you can see in the top map, uh, we allow in the second one, in the AC um, system, we allow the system be built out with um, AC lines um, between the planning regions, um, not across interconnections, of course, in that scenario. And then moving down into our HVDC paradigms where we allow point-to-point uh, -point lines as kind of the traditional way HVDC has built, been built in the, in the country so far, moving you know, generation to load or, or you know, some um, potential other, other uses, um, diversity of resources, uh, those sorts of things, but sort of limited HVDC build out. And then our last scenario, is in multi-terminal, so think macro grid and allowing the system to um, build out with multi-terminal HVDC. So those are our four transmission options. We're gonna cross that with uh, different demand and emissions targets. So uh, this, this top right chart shows our different demand scenarios. So we have a high demand on that orange line, uh, low demand on the gray line, kind of extending the existing growth on demand. Um, and then in the bottom plot, we have different emission scenarios. So you see the black dots showing the historical emissions and the green line on the left showing a steep decline, 100% decrease in emissions uh, from 2005 levels by 2035. The blue line, 90%, reaching 100% by 2050. And then the extended, uh, which would be our current policy scenario. So you can see that in the table. We're crossing all of those um, and getting our kind of emissions demand combinations. And then we cross those with a bunch of sensitivities on costs and you know, potential climate and different types of adoption of uh, distributed resources, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go into all of these, but that's, that's our general scenario framework, You're looking out into the future at all these different systems, comparing costs, comparing you know, system build outs and, and trying to understand what the potential future could hold. Okay, so some takeaways from looking at across all of these scenarios. This is just picking one, um, actually, actually four. So this is a core scenario with our four different transmission options. You can see that there's always a lot of solar, always a lot of wind, always a lot of storage. And the transmission capacity on the far right, uh, quite a big um, 
build out and transmission in all scenarios, you know, especially in our HVDC scenarios. Um, okay, so the decarbonization, this is just generation across all these sensitivities for one of our core scenarios. You can see in, in basically everything, we're seeing huge uh, use of wind and solar, you know, even when we increase costs for transmission by a lot, um, change the price of gas, et cetera. So we're seeing wind and solar is going to play a huge role pretty much any way you slice it for us. Um, and then the last point, you know, being that, you know, transmission is added nationwide. You know, we're seeing value there. Um, these are just, you know, three different maps, our, our AC map, our HVDC point-to-point, -point, and HVDC multi-terminal. You can see there's, there's some trends there that are pretty noticeable. There's, there's transmission built all around the country, but obviously in the Midwest, and as Adria pointed out, there's a lot of potential value there um, between, you know, places like SVP and other load centers on the East, you know, as well as, as some of the same things happening um, on the West Coast. Okay, so I'm going to give a current progress update on where we are to actually transitioning some of these scenarios into the nodal world. So getting into production cost models, um, nodal, and, and then uh, eventually into powerful models. So Jared Wright and Leonardo Reese did most of the work that I'm presenting, um, as well as a lot of other contributors from Edwell. <clears throat> and I should point out in this, actually, in the, in the past slide, so the top is showing our zonal kind of modeling framework. So there's 134 uh, different zones in that model. We're moving down to the nodal world into you know, 100,000 uh, nodes, I think, and um, you know, representing all the different substations and lines on the system. Okay, so I'm gonna focus in on one of these. So the AC scenario, 90 by 2035, high demand, and I'm gonna go into some of the results of our nodal modeling. Okay, so when we look at the details of this system going from 2020 to 2035, we have a 40% increase in um, transmission capacity. So 223 terawatt miles um, by 2035 in this scenario. And so this is still in the zonal world, as you can see, um, our capacity goes up, uh, you know, almost doubling and a lot of it wind and solar and then generation obviously reflecting that um, and taking over the generation stack with wind and solar as well. A lot of this, um, I, I should have mentioned the high demand scenario. A lot of this is uh, in our high demand scenario driven by electrification um, as well. Um, okay, so this is um, showing kind of the challenge of getting down into our nodal modeling. So we have a lot of wind and solar all over the country. This is not showing actual sites of this wind and solar. This is showing where we're connecting them to the transmission system. Um, if you look at the numbers, you can see th this is obviously a huge amount of wind and solar compared to where we are now. 2022 solar is about 140 gigawatts, and, and we're going up to 718 gigawatts in this scenario. So looking for places to connect this, um, and, and that's what we're doing here in these little uh, blue and uh, yellow dots. Um, so actually, these are the, the, the places where these um, sites would connect to the system. And you can see there's a lot of concentration of wind in the middle of the country, obviously, and then solar's uh, pretty much everywhere, but concentrations in California and the Southeast. Okay, so getting to what this actually looks like in terms of figuring out how to build this out from our zonal world. Okay, so the zonal capacity of this transmission in gigawatts here is shown, um, and, and Luckily, or I guess it makes sense that this aligns pretty well with what Adria was seeing, was, was showing in her bar charts, um, where we see huge amount of build out. So in the bold numbers here, what it's showing, if you look between SVP and MISO, the bold numbers are showing the total that we get to by 2035, and in the parentheses numbers is showing the additional that we have to add from our existing system uh, that we have right now. So you're seeing SVP and MISO starting with about 19 gigawatts or 20 gigawatts, and then building know, quite a bit between those regions. And so you see, you know, there's there's concentrations that we, I think we all understand at this point are, are going to happen because of the huge resource in the middle of the country, but there is build out everywhere um, in California and, and across the uh, Northern Grid West Connect scenario. I'm gonna focus in on the Eastern interconnection today. That's where we made the most progress in terms of building our nodal models. So this is the same map, um, but focusing in on, on those seams across uh, the market regions there. Um, the plot is showing the total net transfer capacity. So 
in the red color, you're seeing what our initial number was. And then in the yellow color showing the total expansion. So MISO PJM obviously uh, increasing quite a bit, almost 50% MISO SVP um, increasing 250%. And then uh, down the line, obviously big increases across the country, but some that are going to be particularly challenging to plan into our existing system or build out our, our new system. So I'm just going to, um, I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of a video on the next one. So I just wanted to set that up a little bit in terms of understanding the process that we go through to get from that 2020 system to our 2035 system. So I showed the disaggregation on our initial map where we have the dots of wind and solar and where that's getting connected to the system. So that's the first step. We need to actually figure out where we can connect these things. And we went through a filtering process to get to um, actual points of interconnection that would make sense and um, vetted that with our stakeholders. And then we essentially just start running a bunch of um, nodal production cost models. So this doesn't include our new transmission yet. Um, so we run an unbounded kind of a copper sheet sort of model. We allow transmission overloads and we do a semi-bounded. So the east, so this is just on the eastern interconnection right now. We did semi-bounded because the system was just so big power was just flowing all over the place and it wasn't giving us a lot of good information. So we started to bound along the seams to get us a little more information on what these flows would look like um, between regions. So bounding between the seams, and then we constrain everything on the high voltage uh, as an additional point of information to help us build out this new transmission. Where does power wanna flow uh, and giving us those kind of starting points. So we're kind of armed with a lot of information about where power wants to flow around the country. Once we put this generation on the system, we transfer that over to um, DC power, power flow tool, and we go through an inter iterative transmission expansion, uh, essentially dealing with the overloads that we see on the system. Um, and then we're using our capacity expansion, total transmission build out as a guide. You know, we know that there's certain amount, certain places where transmission sort of wants to be built according to our investment tool, as well as where power wants to flow. And so we go into an iterative planning process with that information. So when overloading is greatly reduced, uh, we're throwing that back over to a nodal production cost model and trying to understand are these results reasonable, correct, feasible. And we're showing that to a lot of stakeholders along the way to understand you know, what issues they have with it. Okay, so if you look in the top left, we're just going through our rounds of iterative transmission expansion. And you can see we're building out new transmission to help meet the needs of and decrease overloads on the system. Um, a lot of large transmission being built in the, in the South, um, as, as well as in the kind of MISO, PJM, SVP corridors. Uh, and, and you will also see a little bit up in the Northeast um, that you'll see kind of right at the end. So we did 31 um, iterations on this. This is not yet complete, but certainly uh, has got us to a system that we feel pretty good about. Most of the major overloads, you know, wh while we're focusing on the interregional in this case, have been dealt with. Um, but certainly, this gets us to essentially an N, N minus zero system, and, and we'll continue to kind of iterate on this um, to do some contingency analysis, as well as uh, get some feedback from stakeholders and and look at PCM results to understand that this is really a system that we feel like is working well. Um, so if you see uh, and point out the legend in the bottom, so we have, you know, we're essentially um, using existing right-of-ways as we understand them. You know, these aren't, um, we're working from models. So we're using existing right-of-ways to increase the power transfer on existing right-of-ways. If we don't feel like we can do that anymore, then we're kind of building new right-of-ways. This is, there's no geospatial analysis going into whether this exact right-of-way or this exact kind of path is, is possible. Um, but this is a starting point for giving us the sort of power transfers that we need. So this is the final result of all those different lines being built. You know, and ultimately, as I said, we're going back and um, trying to understand, does this decrease the curtailment that we saw in some of those early production cost models? Does it decrease production costs from what we saw? Uh, are, the, are the networks adequately used based on the transmission that we built, et cetera, and kind of going through our typical analysis of production cost models to understand, is this reasonable? Do we believe these results? Um, and is the system operating and balancing the way we expect and the way we need it to? So there's a lot more to do. 
as I said, we need to validate all this. We're going through with stakeholders. We're double checking the resource adequacy, throwing the, these results into other models. This is round one of, of two major rounds that we're doing for this study. Um, but we're going to go through this whole list for round one, and then we're going to loop back those learnings into round two. At least that's the idea. It's challenging, um, but certainly, you know, looking to feedback as much as we can into a round two, even back into our capacity expansion scenarios. You know, are there certain corridors that, you know, from an actual nodal model, nodal real system um, kind of feedback where you can't build that amount of capacity across these specific balancing areas? You know, can we kind of go back and tell our capacity expansion model, no, you can't do that, you know, based on the uh, kind of electrical properties of the system? Okay, so in term key takeaways, these are a little bit boring because we are halfway. Um, so hopefully these are more exciting uh, at the end of the year here. But so ultimately, you know, addressing the interregional transmission as the highest priority does help us address a lot of the overloading issues. Certainly we need to get into the regions and fix some issues, make sure power is being exported from certain areas. Um, but addressing the interregional does address a lot of these kind of high, um, high needs on the system. There is good alignment between what we found in our um, building our NOTA model with what we found in our capacity expansion model. So that's that's good. We know that the investment decisions are, are more or less sound and that we can kind of trust those uh, decisions being made by our capacity expansion models. If these diverged a lot, you know, we would be taking a really hard look at the way our capacity expansion model is looking at this, but uh, they're, they're actually pretty close um, from a high level. And we're expecting a lot of different variation between these scenarios. Uh, as you saw, we have 200 in our capacity expansion. We're going to build about five to seven in our nodal world, um, trying to give us a broad view of, of what the system looks like. We're expecting a lot of variation, but hopefully some similarities that we can start to pull out um, and provide for stakeholders as, as different you know, real options that they can pick up and put into their planning processes, hopefully. Okay, so next steps. Um, so these are our expected next scenarios that we're going to build out for nodal. So we're going to do a limited AC expansion as sort of a counterfactual to some of our more ambitious expansions. Uh, we're also going to get into HVDC, um, which we expect to be pretty hard uh, in scenario three and then, and then building out another couple uh, this summer. Um, and, and just to end with a confusing slide, um, so there's a lot of different analyses underway as part of this study. I really focused in on, you know, kind of this, I don't even think you could see it, but the PCM, the production cost modeling, you know, that's where we are focused today, a little bit on the capacity expansion modeling, but ultimately there's a lot of other pieces here. We're trying to understand the resource adequacy. We're looking at stress cases, you know, our extreme events sorts of analyses. Once we have these models built, of course, and then uh, the economic analysis, you know, the, the slide that Debbie showed, you know, looking at all these different um, potential benefits, you know, we want to make sure that we're we're trying to understand that, um, you know, from a portfolio perspective, and even potentially um, kind of smaller portfolios within that. So that's all I have. Thanks. I'm going to uh, switch gears to talking about instead of modeling forward to looking historically um, backwards at actual um, value that uh, transmission brings based on actual historical prices and congestion. And um, so hopefully we got the, the technological bugs worked out and we've got a good presentation up here. And uh, Dev, take it away. All right, hello everyone. Let's see if I can use this, maybe not. Um, okay, so my name's Dev Milstein. I'm from Berkeley Lab. It's great to see you all here today. I'd like to thank my co-authors on all this work and also Adria as well, who provided the initial funding for this work and sort of kicked it all off with me. I'm going to talk about empirical estimates of transmission value. That means estimating transmission value using market prices. And I'm going to focus on conditions in the price record that lead to high value of transmission. I'll go pretty quickly through our approach and the methods so I can focus on the results and just sum everything up briefly at the end. So as we've heard, transmission obviously can provide a whole host of benefits. 
across the system, and it's important to uh, understand all those benefits. We're going to look at a, a subset of the benefits here. The congestion value, which is indicated by the market prices, difference in market prices between locations. So that's and it's an important value. It's sometimes estimated at about half in multi-value studies because this value is very related to the production cost savings. We're not gonna talk about costs in this study. So that makes it easier for me. And, uh, and by using empirical data, we're able to look at real world conditions, including all the complications of those real world conditions and understand how the value of transmission responds to those conditions. And we'll talk, we'll talk about how that relates to modeling approaches at the end as well. All right, our approach is pretty simple. We're just gonna look at real-time differences in nodal electricity prices. That's gonna indicate our congestion value, or another way of thinking about that is the potential cost savings from transmission. There are a few limitations to this approach I wanna mention up front here. So these, this is obviously only a portion of the total transmission benefits. And these are marginal prices. So the values that I'm gonna to show today are subject to saturation effects. As you add more and more transmission, prices would tend to converge. And so um, these values are sort of for the next unit or the next chunk of transmission that you would add. Uh, we don't look at capacity value. So there are capacity markets in many regions and we do not look at those prices. So that's another value uh, that we're not accounting for. And then some of the value we're looking at is due to electricity losses over long distance. So that can cause differences in pricing. And some of the value is due to structural differences between markets when you're looking across regions. All right, so that's a very brief method summary. And now we'll jump into some of the results. So, before I get into the transmission value, I just wanna give a little introduction to nodal pricing across the country. This shows four different years, 2015 to 2021. It's hard to see, but really you don't need to see the details here. What I hope you can see is that there are, well, there's first of all over 50,000 nodes on the wholesale market systems. And you can see that there's sort of clouds of different colors that indicates Average prices for the year at each of these nodes varies quite substantially over time and across location. So that's the context of, of these nodal prices. We're gonna pick out a very few select number of these nodes, hub nodes and zonal nodes, which represent aggregation of area to hopefully minimize the saturation effects I was mentioning. This shows the set of links that we are looking at in historical market data. Again, these are the hub or zonal nodes in all these locations. This is the average value of price difference hourly in real-time prices over 2012 to 2021. So you can see some of the price differences are pretty high. Uh, we're looking at numbers above $20 per megawatt hour in, in many locations. That's the average difference in price over every hour from 2012 to 2021. And of course, some of the links are even higher. It's a little hard to see in this figure, but most of the highest values are interregional links. There are some relatively high values for within region links as well. Another way to think about this is if you, added a thousand megawatts or one gigawatt line be or between these two locations and we're able to capture that full price difference, that would sum up to this, the, the value shown here, which range from 20 to over $600 million per year, just indicated by energy market prices alone. Many of these links are 150 or $200 million per year, just in this particular value again, subject to saturation effects. So 
that's what I mean when I say that they are large values. That's pretty hefty. 2022, you can see all the links getting a lot redder. That many of the $200 million per year links from the previous decade in 2022 were worth double that at 400 million. There's many links now above 200 million. And 2022 was really an outlier in terms of the value of transmission uh, based on these market prices. There was, a, and I'll get into the drivers in a, in a little bit. Uh, here on the left side, we can see this is uh, 2012 through 2022, and it's showing the median. So if you just take all these values and line them up, we pick the middle one, that's the median value uh, across time. And you can see 2022 really sticks out in that time series. In terms of the average value, which is shown on the right figure here, 2022 is less of an outlier. That's because in past years, there were certain regions with very high values that pulled up the whole average, but didn't pull up the median across all the links. Um, and then another takeaway from this is that the transmission value sort of from this perspective moves with average wholesale prices. All right, so now I wanna dive into what uh, is driving these high values. And this is sort of where I want to spend the bulk of the, the time in the presentation. So to understand that, we first looked at two, we took two approaches. So one, we looked at specific weather events and other types of events, uh, stress, grid stress identified by NERC, for example. And we, we made a big list of all these different events and looked at the value of transmission just in those hours and compared it to sort of the average value. And then the other approach was a more general approach where we just ranked all the top hours of transmission value for each of the links and looked at the top X percent of hours of value. And that's how we started thinking about this. Um, and before I give sort of the general results, I wanna give just a, I want to talk a little bit about Winter Storm Elliott because it's a nice example. The numbers shown here uh, are the percent of value for each of the links in 2022 that is due to Winter Storm Elliott. So Winter Storm Elliott only lasted a few days, yet in many areas in the Northeast, those dark blue lines, it accounted for almost 20 or over 20% of the total value for transmission for, for the year in those locations. Uh, that time period was less valuable in other regions. The, the yellow lines show only a couple, a few percent of the value from the year was derived from that time period. There was also a big storm at the same time um, over California as well, which was not the same storm as Winter Storm Elliott. Anyway, this shows how concentrated value can be during a, a one single event. And if we look over the longer time period, 2012 through 2021, we see that these designated or named events, um, you can see my cursor there, accounted for you know, 10 to 20% of the value. So like Winter Storm Elliott was a really large event, it accounted for 20% of the value in sort of the regions where it impacted things most. But if we look at just the top 5% of the hours, and this is inclusive of those extreme events, that accounts for 50% of the transmission value found in the market prices. So that's, that means half of the transmission value comes from a very small number of hours. Um, and if you go down to the top 10% of hours, you get about 60% of the value. So really this 5% roughly is pretty critical to get right in order to think about transmission value. And the other interesting thing is that that's not just extreme weather, right? The extreme weather is going up to 10 to 20%. We've got up to 50% of the value occurring in the top 5% of hours beyond extreme weather events. So what's that, that raises the question, of what's driving that additional value beyond these sort of extreme weather events? 
And so this is work preliminary work and for this like a, a working paper version here. So, uh, but I wanted to show it because we're relatively um, confident about the robustness of these results. We looked at a number of different conditions that might drive high value. And we looked at these top 5% of hours to try to find out what conditions are associated with those high value hours. And we really narrowed it down to three main conditions, which we're calling unexpected events, cold weather, and high net load. Uh, we looked at things like hot, hot weather, and it really was not that associated with these high value events. It's really cold weather. Um, is a, is a portion. And also many of them are overlapping with each other. So that's also important to think about. Notice that there's no extreme events listed here beyond sort of the designation of cold weather and high net load. Uh, that's because extreme events completely fall into one of these three categories. So uh, we don't need a separate category for extreme events, although we could sort of shade if we wanted, I guess, these bars with where extreme events are occurring. So what is an unexpected event? That's the biggest thing that is associated with these high value hours. The way we designed and defined an unexpected event was just as, just by looking at real time prices versus day ahead prices. And we looked at the value of transmission in the day ahead market, and then the value in the real time market. And if there was a large change in nodal prices on one end of the transmission link, we considered that to be an unexpected event. So something changed between when the day ahead market was settled and the real-time market that led to a big price change defined as both greater than $40 per megawatt hour change and a 50% change uh, relative to the day ahead price. There, we don't know what caused these changes is, specifically. Uh, it could be forecast errors, unplanned outages, um, changes in weather, etc. Now, it's not just that those were associated with the high value hours, but they mainly only occurred in the high value hours. This main chart here shows the blue distribution of unexpected events across all hours from low value at the left to high value hours at the right. And you can see that very rarely was an, did an unexpected event occur during a low value hour, and quite frequently they occurred during the high value hours. Similarly, we saw the same sort of shape, which are these smaller boxes on the right for high net load and cold weather. And so this argues at least a little bit that this is caused a, a little bit causal and not just as associated with those hours. Um, okay, so just to review here, we found top 5% of hours accounted for 50% of the value, much larger than the value contained in the named weather events and other extreme events that you would have heard of. We saw that that 50% of value was highly associated with unexpected events, with high net load hours and cold weather, and especially with overlap of all those conditions. All right, so now I wanna think about what that means for modeling transmission value. Um, I have this bullet here that just mentions, we don't wanna only look at the value in energy markets, although that's what the focus of this talk is. Um, but just that's always important to keep that in mind. But when you are looking at energy market value of transmission or the congestion value or production cost modeling or benefit value, those are all very related. Um, we need to make sure to include those extreme events. And we need to think about this unexpected event uh, and how that affects value. And that means that potentially deterministic si simulations, which maybe only go to the day ahead, are missing a big chunk of this uh, transmission value that we see in the market data, but would not see in a simulation of it. Um, just to, to pick on one particular model. So I, 
it, this is all really challenging, so I don't want to pick too much on on models, but um, the if we're looking at in this case the standard scenario modeling, and we look at the zonal prices that match the links that we created to look at our values, we see that uh, the this this figure got a little. Um, messed up, but this is the empirical values that we found. And this is for the same set of links in like mod, uh, current day conditions, the modeling value described by uh, the price output from that model. And so when you're not accounting for all these conditions I was talking about, this is a 3x difference in regional and interregional value. And it's associated with a much lower portion in the modeling world a value from a small portion of the most valuable hours. And so in this case, this model's missing the most valuable hours, and that is leading to a significant underestimate, uh, or, or at least compared to market value now, of, of transmission value. All right. So just to summarize here, regional and interregional transmission links had significant potential value looking at energy market prices. The value of transmission was correlated over time with overall energy prices, and a very small number of high value hours played an outside, outsized role in the value of transmission. The high value hours themselves were associated with unexpected changes to conditions as, as defined by the difference between day ahead and real time prices and also extreme conditions, not necessarily named weather events, but especially extreme cold or conditions that lead to high net load. When we simulate transmission value, we're making the argument here that it's important to capture those unexpected changes and those extreme conditions in the simulations, or potentially we're not capturing the value that we see in the electricity markets. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have additional questions, uh, we have published some of this, not the not all of it, uh, on our website. And um, thanks again to everyone who helped work with me on this research. Thank you again, Dev. That was a great presentation. And um, now I'd like to um, introduce um, my dear friend, Dr. Antje Orts. Um, Antje is a chief engineer for the Danish TSO EnergyNet. And uh, she also uh, works with the European Association ENSOE, where she leads the groups that are um, collaborating on the offshore network development plans as part of the 10-year network development plans, the TYNDP. Um, Antje has an uh, electrical engineering degree from the Technical University of Berlin and received her PhD from the University of Magdeburg in Germany. And uh, Antje, um, uh, co-edited with me the 100% Clean Energy IEEE magazine that's outside on the desk there, so Ansha. Thanks, Debbie, um, and good that you made some advertisement for a fantastic magazine. Uh, yes, now we go to the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, and I'm talking about um, how we do that in Europe, this planning. Um, this is, I think you have seen this several times at this workshop, uh, the general procedure, how we do the um, the onshore planning. So first we start, as you do as well, uh, with scenario building. It's a kind of two years process until we uh, have an idea um, on possible futures. So that's not a forecast, but it's a, a spectrum of possible futures. Usually we have three scenarios uh, for the time horizons, 30, 40, 50. Um, this then is fed into a needs identification process. So same as uh, you had, but uh, um, so we, we built this on uh, a social economic welfare and, and the rest integration and, and have investigations on security and supply, and then have one report for all of Europe. And then we have six regional reports where we go a bit more into details. And then the project promoters, these are the, the yellow arrows, the project promoters, they deliver their projects, which they are about to build. And NSOE then does an assessment of cost and benefit um, for all these projects against 
these scenarios from the beginning, so against the same background, using the cost-benefit analysis method, which actually is owned by the European Commission. So uh, we, we just apply it. So we, we develop it in NCOE and then we apply it as well, but it's not owned by NCOE. Uh, so then you, these projects can be compared. Just quickly, some results from the last edition, t one p 22 uh, so we found, for example, in the identification of system needs analysis that for 2030, 40, 64 gigawatts of additional transmission, uh, cross-border transmission is needed. Uh, and then the proje project promoters, they delivered 140 transmission projects, uh, 23 storage projects, and these have then built, uh, has, have then um, been assessed with this cost-benefit analysis. And then we list, as well, you can find a lot of maps uh, uh, about where these projects or where, where these needs are, where the projects are, what would be the impact on the uh, overall system. And I've listed some figures for you. So uh, of course it saves um, curtailment of um, renewables. And then also it saves, uh, last year there was a lot of focus on, on the impact of gas imports. Um, so this also decreases uh, the gas imports. Um, by 14% of the 2021 uh, usage, and um, it pays back is the summary. So, so generally, the uh, generation costs, they decrease when building infrastructure. I think nobody is surprised here. And so it, it pays back um, um, because generation costs are reduced um, annually. Um, yeah, so now the offshore part. Uh, we have received a new uh, regulation in Europe, and uh, this is built on, or this is a review of an elder regulation we had. So first, uh, the Commission, they wrote a strategy on offshore energy, offshore development in November 2020. And uh, one of the points was that uh, they estimated 800 billion euro being necessary to be invested in this offshore development. And they said two thirds of this 800 billion uh, will, be, uh, will be needed to be spent on infrastructure. So we really have huge investments in front of us. Um, in this new regulation, then NCOE, which is the Association of uh, Transmission System Operators in Europe, uh, is mandated to develop the offshore network development plans. This means that for each of our sea basin, uh, one plan has to be developed. And this plan um, is not just coming from the air, but it should be built on the ambitions of the member states. So also the member states have a task here. They have to deliver um, the targets and it should be joint targets of the member states around one sea basin. Um, and then afterwards, there will be also a price tag will be set on this. How this is organized is also fixed in this regulation uh, indicated here. So first, also the, the most important point is that we all collaborate. So the member states deliver the targets, and so E delivers the infrastructure, and the commission has the task to deliver um, a methodology, how we can set a price on this and also how the cost of this can be distributed among the member states. And this creates a headache uh, currently. So the, the order of sequence is that member states agree on the targets for the three time horizons, 30, 40, and 50. Um, they recently had their deadlines. They did it in January this year. And now we are busy uh, until January next year in NSOE to develop the infrastructure. How could this rest be um, configured, how could this be um, connected to the uh, onshore infrastructure? Then the Commission should, by uh, summer 2025, uh, 2024, develop this cost benefit cost sharing methodology per sea basin. And then we have to apply this on the infrastructure which we found. Uh, so, so, this cost benefit cost sharing, I said it's, it's um, causing headaches because. It was the commission, the intention is that member states should not be surprised uh, what costs are coming to their countries. So they should be informed in the long run so that they have 
um, the chance to negotiate with each other. Um, if maybe Belgium uh, places some uh, offshore wind farms in Danish waters and, and then has to pay a rent or whatever, so, so that these plans can be changed and so that we, um, in the long run, get an optimal system with also fair sharing of costs. But um, nobody knows yet if this will also cost uh, movement of real money between countries or how this is organized. So it's uh, we are really curious what is being developed there. On the other hand, we off, uh, have also on project basis for these projects which have the label project of common interest, we have already a cost benefit cost allocation mechanism. Um, and, and so there, of course, these both mechanisms will at some point um, have to meet and we are finding trying to find out how this could look like and how this impacts each other. In general, the idea is good so that it should not be the coastal states alone that bear all the costs because the energy will also go to the landlocked countries. But on the other hand, it's really complex and it's like putting politics in a mathematical formula and, and think that's the truth. Um, we don't know. Um, yeah. Here you see the six, nay, nee, the five sea basins. The regulation also fixes who collaborates with him, uh, with whom, in the table. So which countries um, should collaborate on the sea basin targets? And in NSOE, we are working on that we use the same approach on all these uh, sea basins, so that we uh, are consistent in how we um, develop the infrastructure for the three time horizons. And so uh, in January next year, we will have five plans in our hand. Um, and that should be high level planned and uh, plans. And we should look at uh, certain categories that's also fixed in the regulation. So we should look at in interconnections at hybrid projects. Hybrid projects are these categories which is have dual functions. So they connect countries and at the same time connect um, offshore rests. Uh, so that uh, the infrastructure is used for more than one purpose. So, so we call it also uh, dual purpose projects or offshore hybrid projects or multifunctional interconnector. You, you can find all these words in uh, various publications. Next category is radial connections, uh, reinforcements on and offshore, and also hydrogen infrastructure, which again is something uh, where we were a bit surprised as uh, in general, the responsibility on European level for hydrogen is not yet fixed. Uh, so it could be ENSO-G, the gas ENSOs, could be something new. But here, ENSO-E has the task to look at this hydrogen in the offshore context. We will see where is, uh, where is the rest, offshore rest uh, located, how much is where by when, and so then we can develop the infrastructure. Um, last year, last year we had a kind of sports on political level because they met all uh, every several months and had new targets, which is a bit uh, difficult when you have to plan something, then you like uh, a certain status of targets. But it was very popular for the politicians. So you, you can see on the top uh, right picture, that's the heads of states of uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany and Denmark, and they agreed in the SBIAC uh, declaration uh, to build 65 gigawatts offshore wind by 2030, which is soon, and 20 gigawatt um, hydrogen by 2050, and uh, 150 gigawatt by 2050. So that's kind of half of the European target would be um, built by these four countries only. Uh, then uh, three months later, um, the Baltic Sea heads of states met uh, in Marienburg, uh, which is also close to Copenhagen. Um, you can see them on the picture, and they agreed on how much uh, offshore res should be installed in the Baltic Seas. And then two weeks later, the energy ministers, or, uh, ministers of the um, North Sea area met in Dublin and signed uh, a statement that they will build, uh, how much they will build um, in the offshore um, in the Northern Seas. I had the, the opportunity to be there and you can guess who are the important people on that picture. Um, in January, I said that uh, the member states had to deliver these targets to the commission. 
And you can see it here, the, the numbers uh, to the left of the table indicate the sea basins. So we, we can see um, here it's 60 gigawatt for the Northern Seas, uh, which has the number one. And uh, all in all in 2050, we'll, we will have up to 354 gigawatts in European waters and plus the 100 to 150 gigawatts, which will be built by Great Britain. So you can see um, Great Britain is gray due to the Brexit. And this does not make it easier to agree or to, to build some reasonable infrastructure. Um, yeah, because kind of one margin of, of the sea basin is missing. But in December last year, um, the North Sea countries collaboration and Great Britain signed a memorandum of understanding. So now we are allowed to collab collaborate, but that's um, yeah, cumbersome because we have no time and we also have to consider all these political uh, conditions if we may talk to each other or may not talk to each other. But now we, now we are allowed and then we can do some work. Um, jumping back to our scenario report from the last TYNDP, just some figures that you have an idea what we have to do. Um, so looking at photovoltaic capacity on these uh, scenarios, distributed energy and global ambition for the three time horizons, you can see this will is expected to increase five to seven times. The onshore capacity is expected to increase um, two to three times. The offshore capacities, uh, 12 to 13 times. And uh, the thermal capacity is looking rather stable because some peaking units uh, are still needed to keep the system running. Uh, the demand is indicated uh, to the right. It's kind of um, up to nearly doubling. So from 2,500 terawatt hours today um, to up to 4,000 terawatt hours in uh, the time horizon 2050. We expect this in the next scenarios to be even higher because electrification has not been considered to, to its full ex extent. Uh, looking at the scenario reports and some figures for the uh, offshores. Uh, so it's looking at uh, four countries only, which is Denmark, Netherlands, uh, Germany, Great Britain. We'll see an increase of five times of what is installed uh, today. Uh, Great Britain alone is three to four times, Netherlands nine to 12 times. We in Denmark really have a challenge, but we also have a plan, uh, 12 to 13 times, and Germany five to six times. So it's, it's really, we have to, to jump, um, but that's not that easy because permissions take time. So when we have to build these 65 gigawatts the four countries I say I mentioned before by 2030, so we have uh, seven years, and also permits take seven years. So it's kind of polit political um, targets are one thing, but reality is something else, and we really have to do uh, our utmost possible that this will succeed. Again, the Commission helped uh, releasing a new regulation, so an emergency regulation, so so that should accelerate permits as well. Um, yeah, we will see if, if that succeeds. Then also we have to order all the assets, uh, which takes time and, and building also. Sometimes building is the fastest part of the pro uh, process of building something. Um, but commission tries to help where they can. Um, so they the member states, they delivered the targets, the joint targets around the sea basin. And uh, we need a bit more, which is which we then fixed in a guidance document for the member states, uh, asking them for what is built by when uh, and where, so that we have the locations, because also sea basins are used in multiple purposes. Uh, you might have noticed that there are also gas pipelines under the water. Um, then we have other electricity uh, pipelines. We have uh, unexploded ordnance for the from Second World War, we have uh, military areas, we have sand extraction, we have uh, sunken ships, uh, everything have, has to be surrounded. So it's good to have this maritime spatial plans, uh, knowing where we can go with our infrastructure and where we should not go. Uh, some examples from the last TIBA NDP, we had already a, a number of um, 
infrastructure projects crossing the waters. And we also uh, had six, in total six, uh, offshore hybrid projects in the last plan. Uh, plan. We developed a methodology, uh, how we can assess the needs for offshore uh, hybrid projects. Um, we will apply this in this uh, planning process we are doing now. Uh, so we use an expansion model, um, looking at where is which infrastructure, which nodes to connect, and then we'll uh, deliver the information, uh, what's, um, which kind of assets are needed by which country, uh, in which amount, at what costs. Um, coming to the, uh, yeah, Denmark, um, we have the plan in Denmark uh, to build these energy islands. Currently, uh, we will have two, in the, one in the North Sea, three gigawatts by 2023, and we will use an existing island, the very practical Bornholm, uh, between Sweden, Denmark, and Germany. Um, and there we will also place three gigawatts offshore wind. Um, the North Sea could be expanded to 10 gigawatts uh, afterwards, and we have plans actually for 35 gigawatt wind, offshore wind in the Northern Seas alone for Denmark. We are country currently having a peak load of 6.5 gigawatts. So it's really a big thinking. And we also need our neighbors and our government uh, had um, memorandums of understanding with Netherlands, with Germany, with Belgium. And so what we do is already in collaboration with our neighbors because we would not be able to um, receive all this energy, but we also will use um, hydrogen solutions so that we can transform this to other forms of energy um, to apply all the energy. And I recommend that you stay to the last session, then Anders will uh, explain a bit more about this, my colleague. And so this was the today's cliffhanger. Another, <laughs> another cliffhanger. So I had intended to have one minute more, Debbie. Thanks. Because in NCOE, we did uh, not only as a, we looked at this offshore development from several aspects and published a series of uh, six papers, uh, which you can see here. So one was, the first one was very general on, uh, you, we have to look at maritime spatial plans, environmental aspects. Uh, we need stable conditions so that the market, market is not unsettled because then the prices would go up. So general aspects. In the second paper, we looked uh, at market design and compared, compared the design of home market uh, solution versus offshore bidding zone under several aspects found that uh, bidding zones are the better solution. Uh, then we looked at interoperability aspects. So it's necessary that assets from different vendors uh, can work with plug and play and so that you don't depend on one um, manufacturer when you build the first uh, thing. And then a big research projects have been initiated financed by the European Commission so, so that we can get further on this way. Then we published a paper on operational aspects, uh, looking, do we need to um, adjust the operational guidelines, operational handbooks? It seems to work, so uh, we just can build and do things. This is always um, the thought we have with these papers. Um, because politicians, they like to adjust le legislation, that's their job, but we are at a point where we need to start and build instead of writing new legislation. Um, then we have um, aspects of financial financing uh, offshore risks. There is a big discussion, um, does this impact, as well, is it attractive for um, wind power to connect to offshore hybrid projects? Do they earn the same uh, compared to radial projects? And there was a discussion that congestion income from uh, TSO should be given to the produ producer, but that would actually violate European law. And so, so we, we investigated this. And also, is, is this a myth or is it true that they earn less when connecting to offshore hybrid projects? So this was investigated in paper five. And in paper six, we looked at who should do this. Uh, should we should it do, uh, be the onshore TSOs? Should we have an offshore TSOs? Should it be a combination of third parties and on or offshore TSOs? Should we have an ISO? And then we looked through the lifetime of uh, offshore projects from building, uh, operating, maintenance, um, and, and different aspects of um, 
yeah, the lifetime of a project and investigated efficiency and, and it came out with a matrix, what is best, what is worse. So the, uh, good morning. Um, there is not a, not an optimal setup, so so we can uh, we we can pick what we what we think is important, uh, and so so this is listed in the sixth in a in a very nice matrix. And I would stop here. Thanks. <laughs>